You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 106. Hey, I'm your host, Dr. Yami. I'm a board certified pediatrician, certified health and wellness coach, author, and speaker. I'm also a passionate promoter of the power of diet and lifestyle in preventing and reversing chronic disease and bringing joy and longevity into our lives. This podcast is focused on plant-based nutrition, habit formation, motivation, and mindset so that you can have the tools to live the best life possible. Are you ready to get started? Let's do this. Down. Is there such a thing as a perfect bowel movement? What, how do we determine what a good bowel movement is? Well, I like to think of a good bowel movement as just like this feeling of complete emptying. So, you know, I talk about it with my kids a lot and my husband is also a gastroenterologist. So we talk about it all the time. Hello, hello, veggie lover. Happy Sunday. I hope that you are having a fantastic day and a beautiful summer. It's July. Can't believe it. Time is flying by. I have an excellent podcast episode for you today from an adult GI doctor, Dr. Supriya Rao. I had her first on my Instagram live, so you can check that out too if you follow me on Instagram. And I wanted to have her back for more to talk about gut motility and what it is, why it's important, what we can do to improve it. So you have some great actionable information in this episode, and I hope that you love it. But before I tell you more about Dr. Rao, I want to remind you about my newsletter. If you're not already signed up, I would really appreciate it if you signed up. You can text the word fiber, F-I-B-E-R to 66866, or you can go to dryami.com forward slash sign up. In addition, If you haven't already subscribed to my podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review. I am putting out bonus episodes all the time now, lots of extra goodies for you that are really information-packed help. They're meant to help you take action and include more plant-based foods in your life and also integrate more health promoting habits to improve your well-being, your joy and your longevity. So please subscribe so that you can get informed of when those are available. And if you don't mind rating and reviewing, that really helps me. So thank you so much for doing that. I wanted to read an amazing review, Amazon review from Creative Mama of 4 for my book, A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy, available on all major online booksellers. But this one is from Amazon, a five-star review from Creative Mama of 4, who titles it Comprehensive, Thorough, Encouraging, Love This Book with three exclamation points. I'm not sure when feeding kids became so complicated and anxiety provoking, but clearly it has. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a need for a book like this one. As a primary care pediatric nurse, I hear from worried moms every day. Their worry is their child does not eat enough or eats too much. They worry their child is too small or too big. They worry their child is a picky eater and might not be getting all the nutrients they need. They worry they may not feeding their child properly. They need a guide to give them direction and reassure them that everything is going to be okay. Dr. Yami's book seems to have arrived just in the nick of time. A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating addresses all these concerns and more. It provides a clear outline for raising intuitive eaters without requiring strict rule following. Dr. Yami also touches on particular problems like picky eating, constipation, and eating disorders. Dr. Yami is not only a pediatrician, but she is also a mom of two, so she understands this stuff. and it's not easy. As far as I know, there's no other resource that comes close to this one. Three things make this book different and unique. One, it's comprehensive and covers everything you could want to know about raising healthy, intuitive eaters from birth through the teenage years. 
Two, it encourages a plant-centered diet yet isn't restrictive or all or nothing. You don't need to be a vegetarian or vegan to follow the principles. Three, Dr. Yami is kind, compassionate, and encouraging and never judgmental. Even if you implement just some of the ideas, your children and family will benefit and it might also lead to more healthy changes down the road. Who should read this book? Moms and dads of babies, toddlers, and children of all ages and even moms-to-be. It's also an excellent resource for grandparents, pediatric health care providers, and child care providers. For me, a primary care pediatric nurse, this book is a resource that fills a gap and adds value to my practice. Highly recommend. Whoa, what a thorough review and so kind. Thank you so much, Creative Mama of Four. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you so much for recommending my book and for using it where you work and where you practice. I really appreciate that. And I hope that more of you that feel like you need help just navigating the complex and sometimes very emotional road of feeding your child, just pick up this book and read it. It's meant to be a guide, to be your friend, to be your helper, and to really help you feel good about how you feed your children so that we can have relaxed and happy dinner tables. So thank you again, Creative Mama of Four. Just a reminder that the information on this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not meant to replace careful evaluation and treatment. So if you have concerns about your own or your child's eating, please consult a doctor or a health professional. Well, let's talk about Dr. Supriya Rao. So Supriya Rao, MD, is a board-certified physician in internal medicine, gastroenterology, and obesity medicine. She is a graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Duke University School of Medicine. She completed her residency in internal medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and gastroenterology fellowship at Boston Medical Center. She is a managing partner of her GI practice, Integrated Gastroenterology Consultants, located in Chelmsford, Massachusetts. She is also the director of medical weight loss at Lowell General Hospital. She is an active member in the Digestive Health Physicians Alliance and involved in health policy advocacy and GI. Her clinical interests include gut health and motility, inflammatory bowel disease, women's health, and weight management. And something else that you need to know is that Dr. Rao is a mom. She's got two young children, a boy and a girl. So we talk not only about gut motility, which is an important concept that I want you to understand, but how she has taken her knowledge about nutrition and lifestyle and plant-based diets and applied it to her own family. So it's such a beautiful podcast episode. I hope you love it. Please follow Dr. Rao on Instagram. Her handle is gutsygirlmd, so G-U-T-S-Y-G-I-R-L-M-D. And then her practice is Integrated GI Consultant, so integratedgic.com in Massachusetts if you want to seek her out for her medical advice. All right, so let's proceed to this amazing episode, and I hope that you have a very plantastic week. Dr. Supriya Rao, thank you so much for joining me on Veggie Doctor Radio today. Thanks so much for having me. I mean, appreciate it. Uh, happy to be here. Well, we had such a great conversation on Instagram Live that I wanted to continue it here for my podcast listeners. But before we get into gut motility, which I think is such a fascinating, interesting topic, I'd love to hear more about your journey. How did you discover plant-based nutrition and what you do now? Sure. So um I'm uh, South Asian American, uh, and so my parents, you know, immigrated to the United States in the 60s and 70s. My mother has been vegetarian her entire life, and so we were raised vegetarian. Um, when I was young, in like you know, I would say the first six or seven years of my life, you know, it was the 80s in New York. Everyone's just trying to assimilate as best as they can. So my parents took me to McDonald's. I have definitely had a hamburger when I was little, um, and so it was just one of these things where they were just trying to you know, fried chicken, hamburger. That was like the only meat that we were really exposed to. And I grew up with my mother's Indian cooking. And so I, over time, just grew to appreciate that much more. And when I was seven, actually, I decided, you know what, I like your cooking best mom, you know, meat for me is just not really where it's at. And so I became vegetarian at that time. 
And, um, you know, I never looked back and, you know, it's just easy with Indian cooking to be vegetarian. Um, but I have to say, you know, when I went to college and in med school, even, um, and part of residency, I was a fairly lazy vegetarian. So it's easy to eat pizza. It's easy to eat pasta. It's easy to eat all the things that are typically deemed vegetarian, but aren't necessarily the healthiest for you. Um, I didn't cook as much in college or, um, med school, as I, I'm sure a lot of people kind of fell into that same uh, category at that time. But as I further along in my training, just, you know, how I would feel after a while if I cooked for myself versus getting takeout, it was a big difference. And so um, I would say in the last, so uh, maybe six to seven years, I've taken it really upon myself to uh, be better uh, about, and actually, so my daughter is six and a half. So basically when she was born, I was like, you know what, this is the time you start changing around the way I eat, even though like I'm vegetarian, I'm not being the healthiest. Um, so I pretty much become plant-based. Uh, I still eat yogurt from time to time. I will, you know, admit to that, but, uh, in general, um, I have been, um, really, you know, trying to promote plant-based just because I feel like it's a healthier diet. Um, I, you know, I just feel that, my family has become healthier for it. We cook every day. And so it's just been something uh, where I've seen big changes in both myself as well as my patients when I, when we kind of promote this. So oh, what a beautiful story. And I love how it was your children, you know, that inspired yeah. you, because I think that happens a lot that my story is very similar. It's my children, my first child, was what I was like, okay, I need to get my act together here, you know, because right, it's not right. just about us anymore. It's about right. these little people that we want to do the best for. Um, and I, I also like how your parents were kind of like, you know, we're vegetarian, but I'm not going to force you to be vegetarian. Right. So you were able to make your own choices from a young age about what you valued and what was important to you. But yeah, I, it was college yeah. and residency and all. It's hard to be. It's hard. It's hard to be like on point with your nutrition when you're so busy with everything else. And also the options weren't necessarily the best, you know, like my, you know, student union in our like, you know, cafeteria and everything, you know, the options weren't great. We weren't seeing these beautiful, you know, macro bowls that we see nowadays. And so um, it was a lot of burritos and pizza and pasta and delicious. So that's what I went for. Um, but again, not the healthiest. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we're going to be like the people that are talk about how we had to walk uphill in the snow both ways. Yeah. You know, like when I, when I was a student, they didn't have these cafeterias that had all these plant-based meals and right, you know, right. true because there's a lot of colleges and universities now that are wanting to provide this for their students. And yeah. I know that the Humane Society of the United States does amazing trainings for colleges and universities so that they can provide more plant foods. And so times are changing and it is getting definitely year for students, but I feel like my kids are so lucky in that way. They have a lot more options than we did. Yes. Up, so. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, I love that story. And when it comes to your, your profession, cause you're a gastroenterologist, yeah. how important has it been for you to have a more thorough understanding of nutrition? So I have to say in medicine, and I think you can also speak to this, we don't get that much nutrition training whatsoever. I think I had a two week module in medical school and residency about nutrition. It's very like, it's not talked about at all. Um, and I would say when I started out in residency and fellowship, and even the first couple of years of uh, being in practice, I'm out of fellowship now, six years. Um, I didn't really think about it as much. It wasn't something that really, you know, I was more considered, okay, Western medicine, just treat, you know, the X problem with Y medication. And so I was very much in that thought process. Um, and I still, obviously there are diseases and, you know, disorders that you need to treat with true, you know, medication. But um, when you, over the last, I would say uh, three, three years or so, I've really kind of started buckling down thinking about what the whole picture is and what people's um, diets are like and what their nutrition is. And so I actually had a whole morning of patients this morning and we were discussing with each one of them, their diet and just really getting to the root of a lot of problems that people have comes from what they're eating. And so mm -hmm. if they're able to make the switch to, um, you know, and I'm not saying cut out meat hundred percent. I don't think, you know, a lot of people can necessarily do that, but making it more of like a condiment or a side dish 
uh, as opposed to being the center of the meal, I think is going to really help a lot of people. If you look at the blue zones across the world, you know, Greece and, you know, Japan and all these places, um, you see that they eat more in abundance of plants as opposed to um, animal products. So I think it's a huge thing for chronic disease, longevity, um, a lot of issues. And so I feel like now nutrition has really become an important part of uh, what I discuss with patients when they come in with motility issues, you know, bloating, um, abdominal pain, uh, weight loss, all of these things. Yeah. Oh, that's so amazing. And, you know, I've heard a lot of physicians use the excuse that patients don't want to hear about lifestyle change, that they don't want to do right. lifestyle change. And so they're not even going to talk about it. But what's been your experience? Do you feel like patients are receptive to the message that, hey, there's things that you can do with your diet and lifestyle that can either avoid or decrease your dependence on medications? Sure. Uh, I think it's a mixed bag. I definitely have patients who are really motivated and they don't want to be on a medication. They would, especially my younger patients who uh, find themselves with some digestive issues or extra weight on, um, they, or at, if they're at an unhealthy weight, I should say. Um, and so they're the ones who are like, you know what, you know, diabetes runs in my family. This is something I just don't want to deal with as I'm turning 40, 50, 60. So they're really motivated. Um, and then I have some patients who, uh, you know, it's just a lot of people are set in their ways. It's really hard to change things sometimes. Even it's hard in teenagers to change eating habits, I find. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, I try and work with those people, just even making small changes here and there. Um, but overall, I, I would say the majority of people would rather do something in their life than take a medication because every medication has a potential side effect. So I think that is something a lot of people think about. And I think that if they can do something within their life, small changes, and I'm not asking them to completely overhaul everything, um, they'd be more apt to do that. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is that for you, bringing up that option is worth it, even oh, if it takes a little so. bit more time. So yeah, Agreed. thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. All right. Well, let's launch into gut motility because I really enjoy this topic. So tell us what is gut motility and why is it relevant to our gut health? So gut motility is basically the peristalsis of, you know, food, food contents going through your entire GI tract. And you want to be able to have proper gut motility to ensure that, you know, appropriate nutrients are being absorbed and toxins are being eliminated when you have your bowel movements. So it's important for it to be under good control. It's important to not be constipated. It's important to not have chronic diarrhea. It's in, like all of these things are important. So obviously there are issues um, that can cause uh, diarrhea and constipation that you know you need to treat with certain things. For example, so celiac disease can cause diarrhea and bloating. So it's important to recognize that, test for it, do an upper endoscopy and diagnose it and make sure a patient is on a gluten-free diet so then their motility is reestablished. Um, people who have chronic constipation, sometimes it can be from medications, you know, a lot of different reasons why, you know, can people can have these changes in bowel habits. So it's good to kind of get down to organic causes and, you know, rule those out. But if we come up with the fact that it's likely irritable bowel, it's likely, you know, something functional, then I really want to work towards changing the diet around and seeing what we can do to ensure that gut motility kind of reestablishes itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Let's go over specifically what are the signs and symptoms of fast gut motility? What could someone be experiencing if their gut motility is going too quickly? Too quickly, right. So like we mentioned, so diarrhea, gas, bloating, abdominal pain, those are definitely things where you feel like, you, so it's going through you so fast that you're not absorbing the proper nutrients and then you're, you might have some weight loss associated with it. Um, so those are definitely things that you need to bring up with your physician um, if you're experiencing that for a kind of quicker gut motility. And then how about if it's too slow? Too slow. Again, you can have abdominal pain and bloating. It's funny how you can have bloating and abdominal pain with both situations, um, but definitely constipation. If you feel like you have to strain, you don't have complete evacuation when you have a bowel movement. Um, and if you feel like uh, you see some a little bit of blood in your stools from straining, you know, possibly from hemorrhoids. Anytime you see blood in your stool, just call your doctor. That's like a very important thing. Um, 
because it could be a lot of different reasons. So that's what I would think if you feel like things have kind of slowed down. Also, um, if your stomach isn't emptying appropriately, you might have a lot of upper symptoms. So a lot of nausea, you might have vomiting, um, just feeling full really early, early satiety. Those are all uh, possible um, symptoms. Okay. And I feel like at one time or another, we can have these symptoms, but you're talking about something that's persistent, that's happening exactly. over a period of time, not just every once in a while. Right. If it happens, I mean, that happens occasionally to everyone. If they, you know, get food poisoning, you know, it can happen, you know, in isolated uh, instances, but definitely if it's persistent over a few weeks, you should definitely give your um, physician a call. Okay. So I want to talk about poop because like, it's one of my favorite subjects as a pediatrician. As is mine. As is mine. <laughs> this down. Is there such a thing as a perfect bowel movement? What? How do we determine what a good bowel movement is? Well, I like to think of a good bowel movement as just like this feeling of complete emptying. So, you know, I talk about it with my kids a lot and my husband is also a gastroenterologist, so we talk about it all the time. Um <laughs> My, my kids think it's hilarious, but um, basically, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a bowel movement every single day. Uh, it can be every other day, whatever is considered regular for you. If you go more than two or three days without a bowel movement, that is not normal. It's amazing actually how many people tell me that and they just figure that that's normal for them. But um, basically a bowel movement every day to every other day. Um, you know, there's Bristol scale, uh, stool scales that we think about, but it should be able to not require you, you have that sensation or urge to have a bowel movement. It should not require a lot of, um, you know, straining or pushing on your part and you should feel like you have complete evacuation. So that to me signals that you've had a good bowel movement. Um, you know, the transit time, you know, from when we eat to when we have a bowel movement for that meal is usually anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. So, um, that, that's a good marker, but it's just kind of this It's a very satisfying feeling. Yeah. I, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, I can imagine that because it's hard sometimes to tell people, okay, this is what it should look like, all right. of these kinds of things. But really, if someone, if you could tell someone, okay, you feel like you have to poop, you go and you feel like you finished, you feel good. Yes. You feel like you emptied, doesn't feel like there's anything left over. You didn't have to push hard, any of those things. Right. Um, so it should be comfortable. It should feel it should feel good is what you're getting at. Right. It should feel good. Um, for example, someone who might have pelvic floor dysfunction, they might seem like, oh, it's not right. And two hours later, they may have to come back. And then an hour later, again, they may have to come back. Um, so that's definitely not having a satisfying bowel movement. So you should feel like you've completely evacuated uh, and no abdominal pain, no bloating. Those would all be signs of a good bowel movement. Okay, great. And I imagine also that the volume of your stools have a lot to do with your diet. Is mm -hmm. there anything wrong with people who eat a lot of fiber and have large volume stools? Is that ever a problem? That's never a problem. If you have bulky stools from fiber, that's fine. There's no okay. issue with that. Yeah. yeah okay. Some people say that they get very alarmed about it and I reassure them a hundred percent. It's fine to have large bowel movements. <laughs> Yes. Uh, and I always joke around that in my family, we have two bathrooms and we're all, all four of us were plant-based vegans. And um, one time I had a contractor come over because I was going to remodel some stuff. And he was like, do you really need that bathroom? I was like, yes. <laughs> like there's often times that we're both bathrooms are occupied and people are doing their business. So it's necessary whenever you eat a lot of fiber around here. Yes, so very, very, very necessary. <laughs> okay. So that's the definition of a good bowel movement. So, but what you're saying is when your gut motility is too slow, you can have hard stools, painful stools, get bloated. Things aren't going through in that 24 to 48 hour period. And so you're going to have issues from that. So can you talk about what things can cause slow gut motility? Right. So um, things to cause it. So a lot of different medications, uh, pain medications uh, is, a, is a common side effect for a lot of different like anticholinergics, medications like that. Um, irritable bowel. So if the brain gut microbiome axis is not working properly, uh, irritable bowel can definitely cause constipation. Um, sometimes inflammatory bowel disease can cut like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Usually you think of diarrhea in those cases, but it can also cause um, constipation. Mm. Um, other causes are just, you know, pure diet can cause it. If you eat a lot of dairy, 
again, it can go either way. Some people get, who are a little bit more lactose intolerant may have diarrhea, but cheese and um, other dairy products can cause a lot of constipation as well. Um, and then uh, I think I mentioned earlier, like the pelvic floor dysfunction, any kind of trauma or disorder of the pelvic floor uh, just shows that you're you're not able to evacuate properly. So even if you're able for things to, to move through the GI tract okay, it's you're not able to evacuate and have a normal bowel movement. So all of these are possible causes for slow um, or and constipation and not having uh, proper or slow down gut motility. Okay. And there's some things that I've been curious about for a while, and that is meal timing meal amount, like the volume of your meals and frequency of meals. And the reason I ask this is because right now, something that's very trendy is intermittent fasting. And some people are pushing it to the limit. You know, they're like eating for two hours a day and that's it, or skipping full days. Mm -hmm. And I know from pediatric standpoint, when kids are sick and they don't eat as much, their stools slow down, but they, you know, it can also be from the virus. If they're having a GI bug, they can do that. So can you tell me what you know, or is there any research or any insight as to when we eat our meals, how big our meals are, if we overeat or if we undereat, can that affect our gut motility? Yeah, it definitely can. So oftentimes, uh, so for example, if someone has gastroparesis, uh, from diabetes, for example, so, um, if they're eating a large meal, it's just going to sit there. And it's not going to be able to move forward. And, or yeah, so diabetes affects the GI tract in, in terms of the nerves, um, the nerve endings. So if you're eating large meals, that's going to definitely just affect your gut motility and you're going to feel pretty bad. That's why we recommend that they have multiple small meals through the day to, to help with the gut motility in that sense. So I think in general, smaller meals pass a lot easier and can help. I actually tell some of my patients with constipation to avoid having that large meal at dinner, but to eat maybe a slightly larger meal at lunch and um, a smaller meal at dinner because after dinner, people usually aren't very active. Whereas at lunch, after lunchtime, people tend to be um, a little bit more active at least during the day. And so uh, I recommend increased activity, smaller meals to help anyone with slow gut motility. Yeah. And in terms of, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. In terms of intermittent fasting, um, I, what I would say is I think, you know, com, you know, shortening that feeding uh, window to two hours is not very healthy. There has been studies in the New England Journal which have showed that, uh, you know, uh, restricted fasting to six or restricted feeding to six hours a day does improve insulin sensitivity and can help with weight loss and things like that. But, you know, I think uh, we still need a lot more um, research to show. I, I, I do practice intermittent fasting and it does help. And I think in certain pa- patient populations who are very motivated and, you know, will eat healthy during that uh, restricted feeding time, it does help. Yeah. And also just put it back on the individual saying that if you feel like you've been practicing for a while and it's affecting you in ways that aren't good, then maybe just mm-hmm. think about it. But I think to me, it makes sense that if you, are overeating, especially if like you eat like a really big meal, that it would slow things down because then your upper GI tract has to go slower in order to absorb all these nutrients. And so I guess, I don't really know because I'm not a GI doctor, but it seems like it would kind of slow everything down because you just put like this huge amount in your system and your system's like, oh, everybody hold up. We got to put all this stuff away. We got to put all these nutrients where they belong. Um, and so maybe that's another reason why overeating may not be a good idea either. You know, I agree. When you have that huge of a load coming into your stomach, all of the hormones that uh, from your pancreas start to sense that huge load, as well as um, you know, uh, bile secretion. It takes uh, time to digest that big of an amount. So smaller smaller meals are definitely easily more easily digested from the enzyme perspective. Yeah, super interesting. And then let's talk about the female menstrual cycle, because, you know, as women, we always have to think about that and how it affects our bowel movements. But how do the different hormones in the female menstrual cycle affect uh, bowel and gut motility? Right. So it's still being studied, honestly. And I think that when, so we're thinking about the menstrual cycle, right? about a week before a lot of women start getting bloating and, you know, cravings. So this increase in estrogen and decrease in progesterone that happens at that time can really force women to start having kind of more diarrhea type situation, more bloating. Um, 
and more cravings. A lot of women talk about wanting to have chocolate or increasing sweet tooth. And so that is definitely seen. Um, and I think, you know, once menses has happened, it's just kind of resetting these hormones and it's really tough. But I think women do see a lot more kind of loose bowel, more um, laxity in their bowel movements about a week or so in leading up to their period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems to be a very common thing. And then how about constipation? Is there a part of the cycle that might lend more towards constipation or slower gut motility? Yeah. So I think, you know, as we're getting towards the midway section ovulation, some women have noted more constipation during that time, but I think it's highly individual. I'm not yeah. sure, uh, you know, how good the studies are that I think after menopause, when, you know, our hormones are, you know, really kind of both decreases in estrogen and progesterone at that time, more women tend to see constipation. At least I, in my experience, I have a lot of, you know, 60, 70, 80 year old women who suffer from constipation. So I think that's definitely uh, an issue that's faced um, after menopause. Yeah. Super interesting. And what about other hormones? Definitely we think about thyroid and things like that, but what are some other hormones that you think of uh, to check or to keep an eye on for people that are suffering from slow gut motility? Uh, mainly, I would say the thyroid because that's definitely hypothyroid and hyperthyroid. Hypothyroid, I always think about constipation, uh, and then hyperthyroid more with diarrhea. Those would be the main things I would consider um, in terms of hormonal uh, uh, in terms of hormonal changes. I really don't do much more in terms in in hormones with the gut motility. At that point, I start looking into more of the diet that people have. Cool. Okay. You brought up IBS. Um, irritable bowel syndrome. And one of the things that can definitely affect our gut motility is our emotional state. So can you talk a little bit more about how our emotions or stress affect gut motility and how that's related to irritable bowel syndrome? Right. So irritable bowel is basically abdominal pain with alterations in gut motility, whether it's constipation or diarrhea. And I would say that women are affected in this country more than men about two times, uh, at least two times as likely. And irritable bowel tends to be associated with anxiety, depression, stress. We see a lot more of uh, those types of disorders in patients who have uh, irritable bowel. Why that's the case, irritable bowel is still being studied. There is some question about this brain gut microbiome. So is the microbiome responsible for a lot of the feelings that people have? Um, you know, they, by taking antibiotics and wiping out good bacteria, does that lead to uh, more likely of depression or, you know, de decrease in uh, depression and mood? And so I think all of that is being studied. Um, in terms of stress, I would say that a lot of my patients who have IBS uh, carry their stress in a way that affects their GI tract. And it's just anecdotal from my perspective. I mean, there are studies that are out there that kind of, uh, there's like some causation, but no true, uh, or correlation, but no true causation. So it's just really hard to say definitively, yes, this is the case, but I've seen it in my practice all the time, that the stress mm -hmm. worsens people's GI symptoms, whether or not it's constipation or diarrhea, and um, just kind of makes things worse. And they, a lot of people tend to be on antidepressants who have issues with their GI tract too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so fascinating because what you're saying is that our emotional state might mm -hmm. affect our GI system, but what's super important, I want to make sure that the listeners caught what you said is that our GI system and the gut microbiome, the bacteria in our GI system can actually affect our mood, exactly. <laughs> which is like mind blowing. You know, when I first heard of this stuff, I was just like, whoa, how, how is that even possible that these little bacteria inside our bodies can actually be affecting how we feel? So that's why it's really important to optimize and to try your best to really uh, foster a healthy gut microbiome, Agreed. which like yeah, so yeah. it's like certain gut bacteria can cause, can produce these neurotransmitters. So serotonin is one of them. And so that definitely will enhance your mood if you have a healthier uh, gut microbiome. Yeah, super fascinating. All right, well, let's let's go ahead and go there then. So I think we've mm -hmm. laid good groundwork about what gut motility is, what the signs and symptoms, what can cause it. So what can we do with our diet and lifestyle habits to improve our gut motility? Right. So I think it's uh, not just one thing. I think it's multifactorial. So as you know, 
being plant-based, I think of a, a whole food plant-based diet with minimal amounts of animal products, I think is one of one of the ways, making sure you're eating a lot of diversity in plants, not just you know certain vegetables all the time, but being able to uh, diversify the types of plants that you're eating, fruits and vegetables, increasing the amounts of plant-based protein. Um, I think that actually there was a study that uh, was done, it was the nurses study, I believe, that showed that um, by using plant-based protein instead of animal protein, uh, women who were uh, trying to get pregnant, there was improvement in fertility actually. And so I would say that plant-based protein increase uh, diversity of fruits and vegetables. And I'm not like a low carb type person. I don't think carbs are evil. I think as long as you're eating complex carbohydrates, which are more difficult to digest, that's also really important. Drinking a lot of water, making sure that you're well hydrated is also important. And I think it's also important to be really mindful about how we eat. Um, instead of, and I'm guilty of this myself, just trying to eat something really quick and then dash out the door for the next activity. But being sitting down at a table, putting your phone away, if you're eating with your family or by yourself, whatever it is, just sitting, looking at your food, kind of engaging your senses while you eat and not doing it in a rushed fashion. And when you eat, you have like body cue, like you listen to the cues of your body and just say, okay, I'm eating right now, really enjoying what I'm eating. And I eat till you're just short of being a completely full, you know, not eating to the point of being overstuffed and uh, feeling kind of uncomfortable, but just being able to listen to your body and say, okay, I've eaten what I need to eat. I can move on uh, to the next activity, but at least taking, you know, a good 20 minutes to sit down and really appreciate the act of eating. I think being mindful about how you eat is really important. Um, talk about water, I would say sleep is perhaps one of the single most important things that your body needs in order to uh, have proper gut motility. Sleep is restorative. Uh, they've, there have been studies which show that people who get less sleep as opposed like five, five to six hours versus seven to eight, there is issues with weight, chronic diseases, even if they come, even if they follow the same exact diet. So I always talk to my patients and really get a good sense of how good their sleep is. You know, I know as being in this society uh, now, we're always worried about fear of missing out of something, but I tell my patients, trust me, go to bed and, you know, wake up at regular, at regular times to ensure that your circadian rhythm is uh, intact. I think it's really important. I am guilty of this throughout my entire life. And now in the last couple of years, I've made that change uh, considerably, I would say. Um, and, you know, just trying to manage your stress levels. I think all of these are going to really enhance uh, your motility and your overall health. That's awesome. Yeah. Basically lifestyle medicine for the gut, right? I mean, yeah. it's like we keep saying the same things over and over again, which is awesome because it means that these same habits and behaviors can help optimize so many different areas of your life and your body. Really quick for water, because I have heard all kinds of recommendations. <laughs> so what do you tell your patients as far as how much water they should be drinking or what, what, how can they gauge what's enough for them? Right. I say that, you know, if you are able to have regular bowel movements with the amount of water that you're drinking, like you don't feel like parched. I, I say eight, eight, eight glasses of water a day, eight, you know, 64 ounces or so is kind of a rough estimate, but you know, for some people, they may need a little bit less. Some people may need more. I just tell them to kind of gauge, you know, by their urine output and their stools just to kind of get a sense of uh, their water intake. One thing I actually forgot to mention in terms of the lifestyle is also exercise. Exercise obviously is really important. Getting out and moving, being sedentary uh, leads to earlier death. And so if we're worried about, you know, our overall lifestyle and just be, your, your gut motility, you know, is really important for you to be active. If we're just sitting around and mo not moving at all, you're gonna more likely be constipated. Things aren't moving at all uh, in your gut. So any kind of exercise is important uh, for, I don't say, I don't use it as, as important for weight loss, but for weight maintenance and overall, just overall health, it's really important. But yeah, getting back to water, I, I use kind of eight glasses as a rough estimate. Okay, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, speaking about the exercise topic, we're meant to move as humans where mm -hmm. our bodies are built to move. We're meant to actually walk long distances together. So this modern lifestyle of sitting all the time is really affecting a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And 
including the gut. So yes. getting out, even if you can't, if you don't feel like you want to do this like heavy workout and that scares you, just walk, go out and walk to one of the healthiest forms of exercise you can do because you can do it for so long. And there's people that are in their nineties that go out for walks and they can still sustain that level of exercise. So that's a great, great point. When it comes to mindful eating, I think that this is so important because just like we were talking about earlier with avoiding overeating, Whenever you are mindful about your food, you sit down, you pay attention, you tune into your body, you're less likely to overeat. But do you ever talk to your patients about chewing and paying attention to properly and thoroughly chewing their food? Yes, as a gastrologist, I find this very important because I get called a lot at 2 a.m. for someone who has a piece of meat or something stuck in their esophagus. So yes, I always talk about <laughs> chewing, mainly for my benefit, so I don't have to do a case in endoscopy at three in the morning. But yes, in general, I do talk about being able to sit down, not overeat, chew your food properly so that you get the full benefit and uh, appreciation for your food. Yes. Yeah. And it makes sense in a lot of different ways too. And I know when I talked to um, Michelle Yanover, who's a dentist, she talked about the importance for our teeth with the amylase when we are properly chewing our food. So it starts right. at the mouth, but also whenever we chew, it's like we're our own blender, right? So we're able to pull out all of those nutrients. But I can imagine if you don't chew your food, things can get stuck for sure. Yes. Meat's the most common, right? Do you <laughs> ever get, do you get plant-based things stuck in there ever? <laughs> I have never. The only time it's plant-based is if a piece of meat got stuck and then people try to eat something on top of it to push it down. So okay, that's good. the only time. <laughs> I was worried. Okay, guys. So see, another reason not to eat meat, okay? It can get stuck in your esophagus. But anyway, so whenever you're, you're chewing your food thoroughly for your body, then it's less work that your body has to do too. So I can imagine that maybe that can improve your gut motility. That You're not just like partially chewed food sitting in your stomach and your body's trying to like break all that down and absorb all those nutrients. Right. Just so imagine. there's definitely, there's like a mechanical part of digestion as well as the chemical part. So if you're able to really work on the mechanical part in your mouth, the stomach doesn't have to work as hard to break it down. And so it just makes it easier. Awesome. Thank you for validating my half understood <laughs> gastroenterology <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> okay, so very good. So basically, predominantly whole food plant-based diet, low in animal products, definitely get your complex carbs in there, drink mm -hmm. your water, eat mindfully, exercise, and sleep. manage your stress. Oh, and sleep. So and sleep, all, yeah. all of those are so important. There are things that you can do with your diet and lifestyle to improve your gut motility. Okay, so say somebody's done this and they're still having concerning symptoms. When should somebody be concerned that they have a gut motility problem that deserves medical attention? What are the warning signs for that? Right, so I would say persistent symptoms like we talked about, weight loss, blood in the stool, persistent constipation, persistent diarrhea. For that, in those cases, I'd be con concerned, for example, diarrhea, is it more than IBS? Do they have inflammatory bowel disease, with, especially if it's coupled with weight loss? Any you know, concerning lab uh, blood testing, obviously, would, would come into that. But it's just having done all the lifestyle uh, interventions and still having symptoms past that, then I would want to do kind of more invasive, not in the book, just more complete workup at that point. Yeah. See your medical professional if things aren't getting better, basically, because you don't want something to be going on and you're trying to manage it, but you're not making progress. So basically that's what we're trying to say. Okay, okay. This has all been so great. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention about constipation or gut motility that we haven't covered? Just to think, you know, it's not, not to be scared of talking to your physician about it. I feel like a lot of patients put things off for a long time. And especially now with COVID and offices not fully reopening, I think that's the most important thing. Don't put off your symptoms because it can mean that there's something uh, you know, more insidious uh, going on. I've had patients, so another motility, like, so we didn't really talk about esophageal disorders as much, mm -hmm. um, but those are also motility disorders. And um, so, for example, achalasia is a 
disorder that we see commonly in patients can't swallow, food's getting stuck a lot of the time, uh, there can be inflammation in the esophagus. And so to deal with those kinds of things for a long time, it's just going to make things worse. You're going to have a lot uh, worse outcomes. So be sure to not ignore the symptoms that you have and just talk to your doctor about it. Talk to your primary if you want to initially. And then if uh, they're not able to handle it, they'll refer you to a gastroenterologist. And I think it's really uh, really important, especially with the pandemic right now, to not ignore, everyone's worried about COVID, but don't ignore your GI symptoms. Mm-hmm. Very, very important. Thank you so much for that. What do you wish more people knew? What do I wish more people knew? I wish that more people knew that you don't need meat for protein. <laughs> <laughs> the best. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, um, you know, I had a chance to do an interview with Dr. B, uh, Will Bolshevitz, who wrote Fiber Fueled. And it's funny, we had this discussion and um, there is no protein deficiency in this country. People aren't, unless you have a true malabsorptive disorder or you uh, have some type of chronic illness like cirrhosis, people don't have protein deficiencies. Everyone is so concerned in this country about getting protein And that really should not, we get 70% more protein as Americans than we need. Mm -hmm. Our body doesn't need that much, uh, as much as we think. And so thinking that we have to be drinking milk, thinking that we have to eat large amounts of meat to be able to sustain our body's need for protein, I think is just really misguided. And so I think there are a lot of really plant-based proteins that offer fiber as well as uh, complex carbohydrates, which are necessary for the body. I think if we are able to explore those sources of protein more and make them more mainstream as they are starting to become now, I think people will realize that you don't need meat as much. Yeah, no, I love it. And it is, it's just one of those things that gets passed down in our culture because as a pediatrician, parents are so concerned about it all the time. They're so worried if they're toddler doesn't want to eat meat and they get so happy when they're like, oh, they ate their chicken nuggets because they got their protein. But Mm -hmm. really, as long as you're offering your child a variety of whole plant foods and they're eating when they're hungry, stopping when they're satisfied, they're eating sufficient calories, they're getting enough protein. So really, we should be worried more about getting enough fiber. I wish people were obsessed about fiber. Like, wait, does that have fiber? (laughs) No, instead of does that have protein? (laughs) That would be awesome. I agree. I think the study is like basically only three to 5% of Americans get the actual required fiber that they need in their diet. And so Mm -hmm. it's just, and when I talk to my patients about what they're eating, there's no fiber anywhere. A lot of, you know, patients are in food deserts and they don't have those, you know, options necessarily available to them. And I think that's one of the most, like the largest public health issues in this country is access to healthy food. And so not just access to any food or food like products, but access to true uh, whole foods that are going to sustain us in a healthy way. Because as you know, you know, childhood obesity is on the rise. Obesity in general in this country is on the rise and just leads to more chronic illnesses. So um, this, need for meat to be protein or animal products for protein is just not, uh, I don't think it's where it's at. So yeah. Okay. I love it. Well, I'd like to learn more about what personal habit you're most proud of. How did you develop it and how do you maintain it? So I would say, uh, and it kind of goes to my kids because, uh, they've kind of, um, inspired me to be better. And so I just, I'm proud of engaging them in what we eat. And so I cook almost, and so, and I also cook almost, I would say 95% of the time, my husband does cook as well, but I'm kind of uh, the main chef in the house. And so I'm proud of being able to provide my family with healthy meals and, you know, the way that they can best possibly, you know, be healthy. And I'm proud that I engage my kids in um, what they're eating. So they know every single night we talk about what we're eating, what the good parts of it are. Obviously they eat treats too. They like, they're just like any kid, but they, I have them come, you know, my, my daughter is now starting to learn to chop some vegetables. And so having her be part of that process, my son likes to stir things. And so, you know, they always kind of bring their little step stools and stand next to me and we kind of cook together as a family or prepare our meals together as a family. And so I'm really proud of that because I feel like it really gives them buy-in to what is healthy and what we should be looking for in our food and what makes it vibrant and what makes it exciting. And so food is really important to me and it's very important to my family because I feel like 
we've made it a central part of us and a central part of kind of like our gatherings in the evening. So I think um, that's one of the main things I'm really proud of. Yeah. And it's so beautiful because you're nurturing them, not just with the food and the time and the care that you're putting into it, but also the nutrients, the well-being and the longevity. So, oh, I love that so much. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite family meal that you guys share together? So uh, I cook a lot of Indian food. And so that's kind of one of the things I'm South Indian and South Indian food is very different from uh, what people get in most restaurants. So, you know, people are usually used to kind of like the tikka masala and like heavy kind of gravy based um, curries in Indian cooking. But as a South Indian, it's a lot drier. Uh, almost there's hardly any, um, you know, cheese. there's no cheese or anything really in South Indian cooking. Um, we have fermented foods. And so I would say a traditional South Indian meal, which has two to three different vegetable curries, a lentil based dal or lentil stew and, um, you know, rice as part of it. I tend to eat more brown rice or quinoa with it. And that's kind of like my favorite meal to make with them. And it's one meal I know for sure, like they will eat that without any problem over pizza. Like sometimes oh I have to like, you know, if we have pizza for dinner or something one night and it's almost like they don't, they're kind of excited about it, but they're excited about the novelty of it. But then they're like, yeah, I'd rather have like, you know, doll and rice. And so it's kind of funny to think about that. Um, my favorite non-Indian meal that I make is kind of like this Mediterranean. I make falafels and, you know, hummus and kind of like all these different dips. And uh, that's really great. And then uh, Mexican food we eat a lot of as well. So. Oh my gosh. I'm definitely going to be visiting your house. Yes. What <laughs> state What state are you from in India? Uh, my parents are from a state called Andhra Pradesh in South India. Hyderabad is the main city in Andhra Pradesh. And so every, we were actually, we had a family trip to India in November. And so the, my husband and my kids, we all went. And it's just so easy to gorge yourself over there. Oh my gosh. But you're also walking around and moving around a lot more. Um, But uh, yeah, that's basically when it comes to when I think of comfort food is um, kind of the food I grew up with that my mom made. Yeah, so delicious. And do you cook pretty spicy or do the kids not tolerate as much spice or are they eating spice already? They're getting, so my daughter is six and a half and my son is almost five. And so uh, we've increased, and so, and my husband is Taiwanese. And so when we eat Asian food, we add a lot of spice to it. Uh, We eat spicy Indian food. I eat very spicy food, which I don't think they can handle, but they are starting to increase it. They're now asking, oh, can I have some more sriracha in my stir fry? Can I have this kind of, you know, lemon pickle or mango pickle with my food? So they're definitely getting more into it and more excited about spicy food. And I think think kids are really resilient. And I think if you, and they're really um, adventurous, if you give them the chance to eat different kinds of food, they may surprise you. You don't really always need to feed them mac and cheese. And I know my know kids like mac and cheese too, but like, it's just, they're a lot more able to appreciate different foods if you introduce it to them as something that is uh, normal. So. Absolutely. My point, exactly. I was kind of leading you there <laughs> See, <laughs> um, because I think a lot of parents in the mm-hmm. United States, especially they think that kid food is chicken nuggets, mac and cheese, goldfish crackers, and, you know, like fruit leather or something like that, you know, fruit snacks. But really, as you're showing, you have kids that you're raising in the United States that have this very wide, varied palate because you are exposing them to those flavors and you're making it part of the routine. You're making it part of the family. And I imagine you're not forcing them, right? So you're presenting the food. They decide if they want to eat those kinds of things. Yeah, Yeah. There's no forcing in my house. Like when they say that they're full, if they have one bite less, I'm like, just fine, just finish that last bite. It's then you can be done. But they, when they're done, they're done. I don't force them to eat, but they eat okra, they eat eggplant, they eat, you know, really, they eat salsa, they cut, you know, cauliflower, broccoli, artichokes, they eat all sorts of different vegetables in addition to a plethora of different beans, lentils, legumes. Um, and I, for the most part, and if it's something that's very new to them and they're just like kind of not sure about it, they're like, I said, just try it. You can tell me if you like it or not. If they don't like it, I don't push it. That's fine. Yeah. I feel like, you know, they're old enough to make that decision, but if they like it, then it's just an- another thing to add to the, um, you know, changing repertoire of things to offer them for food. I like to keep it diverse, but I also, I also have things we always come back to. We usually have Indian food at least three times a week, but I think uh, it's important to be able to appreciate it because when I was growing up, I ate Indian food almost every single day. I didn't, I wasn't exposed as much and 
I love my mom's cooking. Don't get me wrong. But when I went to college, I was like, wow, there's a lot out here that I wasn't aware of. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but uh, I want to be able to give them that diversity and to just be able to appreciate all different kinds of food. Yeah, it's such a gift. So yes, thank you. And they will thank you as well for yeah. providing that gift to them. That's amazing. How can listeners connect with you and what services or products do you offer? Sure. So um, I'm on Instagram at gutsygirlmd, uh, just G-U-T-S-Y-G-I-R-L-M-D. Uh, people can DM me. I've actually gotten some DMs just about questions. I don't really offer medical advice over DM, but I can kind of point you in the right direction for resources. Um, I practice in Massachusetts and, uh, you know, my, uh, practices website is integrated GIC.com. You can find, um, us on our website, uh, where a full, you know, a uh, range of services that we offer in gastroenterology. I'm the director of our uh, medical weight loss center at the hospital. So it's, uh, you know, just talking about obesity, weight loss, um, and just kind of preventative lifestyle. That's all what I'm about in addition to being a gastroenterologist. So those would be the main things. We offer a comprehensive weight loss program at uh, our office and the, and the hospital. So those would be the two main places you can find me. Awesome. And I'll make sure that those are in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Rao, this has been fabulous. What a wonderful conversation. And I know that the listeners will appreciate all the knowledge that you bestowed on them today. But before you leave, can you please leave my listeners with a call to action? What one thing can they do to improve their lives this week? Right. One thing to, that you can do, I would say, I feel like there are a lot of things I can offer, but the one thing I would say is just to Try to increase the amount of plants that you're eating in your diet. That's one thing, a simple thing. It doesn't have to be every meal, but just start with one meal and see how it goes. And I think you'll be surprised that plant-based eating is not as scary as it appears. I think um, people are just worried about, again, the protein issue, but I'm more concerned about the fiber issue, making sure that your gut is healthy, making sure that you're feeding your intestines with good fiber to continue to um, multiply those good bacteria and to improve your motility, to improve your health, to improve uh, and prevent chronic uh, medical conditions. So just try replacing one to two meals a week with a more plant-based, with plant-based um, nutrition. I think you'll see an improvement in your health. Beautiful. And yeah, step-by-step step, you can get there and you'll start to feel the difference and then it'll just be easier and easier as you start to make that connection between your actions and your well-being. And so then it's just not, it's a no-brainer. It just gets easier and easier. I agree. Well, thank you so much. This has been fabulous. I really appreciate your time. So thank you for being a fabulous guest on Veggie Doctor Radio. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And I hope uh, I helped uh, someone out there just with, again, one small step, you can really change your lifestyle and your health. Absolutely. Have a very plantastic day. <laughs> Thank you. You too. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Thank you for tuning in. And I look forward to having you back again next week. A very special thank you to the band Rocket Surgeons for permission to use the broccoli song. To find out more about the Rocket Surgeons, please visit their website at rocketsurgeonsband.com or Facebook at Rocket Surgeons Music. Please subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Also, all of my social media links can be found in the podcast description. Send me a message and let me know what you think of today's podcast. Sharing is caring. Please share, rate, and review my podcast and drop me a line if you have ideas for future episodes. Thank you once again and have a plantastic day. We're having broccoli.